Click the link in the description to sign up for a free 30-day trial from audiobooks.com. Section 22 of A Book of Myths This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. A Book of Myths by Jane Lang. Section 22. Icarus. Fourteen years only have passed since our twentieth century began. In those fourteen years, how many a father's and mother's heart has bled for the death of gallant sons, greatly promising, greatly daring, who have sought to rule the skies. With wings not well enough tried, they have soared dauntlessly aloft, only to add more names to the tragic list of those whose lives have been sacrificed in order that the groping hands of science may become sure, so that in time the sons of men may sail through the heavens as fearlessly as their fathers sailed through the seas. High overhead we watch the monoplane, the great swooping thing, like a monster black-winged bird, and our minds travel back to the story of Icarus, who died so many years ago that there are those who say that his story is but a foolish fable, an idle myth. Daedalus, grandson of a king of Athens, was the greatest artificer of his day. Not only as an architect was he great, but as a sculptor he had the creative power not only to make men and women and animals that looked alive, but to cause them to move and to be, to all appearances, endowed with life. To him the artificers who followed him owed the invention of the axe, the wedge, the wimble, and the carpenter's level, and his restless mind was ever busy with new inventions. To his nephew Talus, or Perdrix, he taught all that he himself knew of all the mechanical arts. Soon it seemed that the nephew, though he might not excel his uncle, equaled Daedalus in his inventive power. As he walked by the seashore, the lad picked up the spine of a fish, and having pondered its possibilities, he took it home, imitated it in iron, and so invented the saw. A still greater invention followed this. While those who had always thought that there could be none greater than Daedalus were still acclaiming the lad, there came to him the idea of putting two pieces of iron together, connecting them at one end with a rivet, and sharpening both ends and a pair of compasses was made. Louder still were the acclamations of the people. Surely greater than Daedalus was here. Too much was this for the artist's jealous spirit. One day they stood together on the top of the Acropolis, and Daedalus, murder that comes from jealousy in his heart, threw his nephew down. Down, down he fell, knowing well that he was going to meet a cruel death. But Pallas Athena, protectress of all clever craftsmen, came to his rescue. By her, Perdrix was turned into the bird that still bears his name, and Daedalus beheld Perdrix, the partridge, rapidly winging his way to the far-off fields. Since then, no partridge has ever built or roosted in a high place, but has nestled in the hedge roots and amongst the standing corn, and as we mark it, we can see that its flight is always low. For his crime, Daedalus was banished from Athens, and in the court of Minos, king of Crete, he found a refuge. He put all his mighty powers at the service of Minos, and for him designed an intricate labyrinth, which, like the river Meander, had neither beginning nor ending, but ever returned on itself in hopeless intricacy. Soon he stood high in the favor of the king. But ever greedy for power, he incurred by one of his daring inventions the wrath of Minos. The angry monarch threw him into prison, and imprisoned along with him his son, Icarus. But prison bars and locks did not exist that were strong enough to baffle this master craftsman, and from the tower in which they were shut, Daedalus and his son were not long in making their escape. To escape from Crete was a less easy matter. There were many places in that wild island where it was easy for the father and son to hide, 
but the subjects of minos were mostly mariners and daedalus knew well that all along the shore they kept watch lest he should make him a boat hoist on it one of the sails of which he was part inventor and speed away to safety like a sea-bird driven before the gale then did there come to daedalus the pioneer of inventions the great idea that by his skill he might make a way for himself and his son through another element than water and he laughed aloud in his hiding place amongst the cypresses on the hillside at the thought of how he would baffle the simple sailormen who watched each creek and beach down on the shore mockingly too did he think of king minos who had dared to pit his power against the wits and skill of daedalus the mighty craftsman many a cretan bird was sacrificed before the task which the inventor had set himself was accomplished in a shady forest on the mountains he fashioned light wooden frames and decked them with feathers until at length they looked like the pinions of a great eagle or of a swan that flaps its majestic way from lake to river each feather was bound on with wax and the mechanism of the wings was so perfect a reproduction of that of the wings from which the feathers had been plucked that on the first day that he fastened them to his back and spread them out daedalus found that he could fly even as the bird flew two pairs he made having tested one pair a second pair was made for icarus and circling round him like a mother bird that teaches her nestlings how to fly daedalus his heart big with the pride of invention showed icarus how he might best soar upwards to the sun or dive down to the blue sea far below and how he might conquer the winds and the air currents of the sky and make them his servants that was a joyous day for father and son for the father had never before drunk deeper of the intoxicating wine of the gods success and for the lad it was all pure joy never before had he known freedom and power so utterly glorious as a little child he had watched the birds fly far away over the blue hills to where the sun was setting and had longed for wings that he might follow them in their flight at times in his dreams he had known the power and in his dreaming fancy had risen from the cumbering earth and soared high above the trees and fields on strong pinions that bore him away to the fair land of heart's desire to the islands of the blessed but when sleep left him and the dreams silently slipped out before the coming of the light of day and the boy sprang from his couch and eagerly spread his arms as in his dreams he had done he could no longer fly disappointment and unsatisfied longing ever came with his waking hours now all that had come to an end and daedalus was glad and proud as well to watch his son's joy and his fearless daring one word of counsel only did he give him beware dear son of my heart he said lest in thy new-found power thou seekest to soar even to the gates of olympus for as surely as the scorching rays from the burnished wheels of the chariot of apollo smite thy wings the wax that binds on thy feathers will melt and then will come upon thee and on me woe unutterable in his dreams that night icarus flew and when he awoke fearing to find only the haunting remembrance of a dream he found his father standing by the side of his bed of soft leaves under the shadowy cypresses ready to bind on his willing shoulders the great pinions that he had made gentle dawn the rosy-fingered was slowly making her way up from the east when daedalus and icarus began their flight slowly they went at first and the goat-herds who tended their flocks on the slopes of mount Ida looked up in fear when they saw the dark shadows of their wings and marked the monster birds making their way out to sea from the river beds the waterfowl arose from the reeds and with great outcry flew with all their swiftness to escape them and down by the seashore the mariners hearts sank within them as they watched believing that a sight so strange must be a portent of disaster homewards they went in haste to offer sacrifices on the altars of poseidon ruler of the deep samos and delos were passed on the left and labynthos on the right 
long ere the sun-god had started on his daily course and as the mighty wings of icarus cleft the cold air the boy's slim body grew chilled and he longed for the sun's rays to turn the waters of the aegean sea over which he flew from green grey into limpid sapphire and emerald and burning gold towards sicily he and his father bent their course and when they saw the beautiful island afar off lying like a gem in the sea, Apollo made the waves in which it lay for it a fitting setting. With a cry of joy Icarus marked the sun's rays paint the chill water, and Apollo looked down at the great white-winged bird, a snowy swan with the face and form of a beautiful boy, who sped exulting onwards while a clumsier thing with wings of darker hue followed less quickly in the same line of flight as the god looked the warmth that radiated from his chariot touched the icy limbs of icarus as with the caressing touch of gentle life-giving hands not long before his flight had lagged a little but now it seemed as if new life was his like a bird that wheels and soars and dives as if for lightness of heart so did icarus until each feather of his plumage had a sheen of silver and of gold down down he darted so near the water that almost the white-tipped waves caught at his wings as he skimmed over them then up 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 he soared ever higher higher still and when he saw the radiant sun-god smiling down on him the warning of daedalus was forgotten as he had excelled other lads in foot races now did icarus wish to excel the birds themselves daedalus he left far behind and still upwards he mounted so strong he felt so fearless was he that to him it seemed that he could storm olympus that he could call to apollo as he swept past him in his flight and dare him to race for a wager from the aegean sea to where the sun-god's horses took their nightly rest by the trackless seas of the unknown west in terror his father watched him and as he called to him in a voice of anguished warning that was drowned by the whistling rush of the air currents through the wings of icarus and the moist whisper of the clouds as through them he cleft away for himself there befell the dreaded thing it seemed as though the strong wings had begun to lose their power like a wounded bird icarus fluttered lunged sideways from the straight clean line of his flight recovered himself and fluttered again and then like the bird into whose soft breast the sure hand of a mighty archer has driven an arrow downwards he fell turning over and yet turning again downwards ever downwards until he fell with a plunge into the sea that still was radiant in shining emerald and translucent blue then did the car of apollo drive on his rays had slain one who was too greatly daring and now they fondled the little white feathers that had fallen from the broken wings and floated on the water like the petals of a torn flower on the dead still face of icarus they shone and they spangled as if with diamonds the wet plumage that still widespread bore him up on the waves stricken at heart was daedalus but there was no time to lament his son's untimely end for even now the black proud ships of minos might be in pursuit onward he flew to safety and in sicily built a temple to apollo and there hung up his wings as a propitiatory offering to the god who had slain his son and when grey night came down on that part of the sea that bears the name of icarus to this day still there floated the body of the boy whose dreams had come true for only a little while had he known the exquisite realization of dreamed of potentialities for only a few hours tasted the sweetness of perfect pleasure and then by an overdaring flight had lost it all forever the sorrowing nereids sang a dirge over him as he was swayed gently hither and thither by the tide and when the silver stars came out from the dark firmament of heaven and were reflected in the blackness of the sea at night it was as though a velvet pall silver-decked in his honour 
was spread around the slim white body with its outstretched snowy wings so much had he dared so little accomplished is it not the oft-told tale of those who have followed icarus yet who can say that gallant youth has lived in vain when as icarus did he has breasted the very skies has flown with fearless heart and soul to the provinces of the deathless gods when even for the space of a few of the heartbeats of time he has tasted supreme power the ecstasy of illimitable happiness end of icarus recording by james k white chula vista Greatest Audiobooks is excited to partner with Audiobooks.com. Sign up for a free 30-day trial and get your first audiobook free. Cancel any time, no strings attached. Click below to get your free audiobook today.